Interesting. It's filming with a flashlight for some reason. Anyway, I just wanted to quickly show you. I'm heading out real quick and I have Motherless Brooklyn that I'm putting in my backpack because I'm gonna go to the Brooklyn Bridge Park. And then I'm also gonna pack this huge William Shakespeare so I can catch up on my Julius Caesar as I'm out and about in the city. And today, I, besides my purse, I think I was like wanting to bring this kind of tote bag, but I was like, ah, actually, let's get a backpack. I think it'll be a little bit better. So yeah, that's what I'm doing. Just packing some stuff, finishing, I'm getting ready. It is extremely early. It's not even six o'clock yet. And I'm super excited to go to the park and to walk on the bridge. Hopefully it's open and we'll take it from there. Good morning, guys. I'm headed out to the Brooklyn Park. I quickly packed my bag. I think I have everything. Lotion, <laughs> wallet. I almost left my keys the other day when I went to the beach. I was like taking shots and everything. And I'm like, wait a second my car keys i knew the building keys like what are you doing like focus pay attention yeah <laughs> anyway i just ordered a lift and it should be coming any minute now so i'm gonna quickly head on downstairs and catch my ride and see if i can be one of the first people at the park we'll see how it is for my first time there i'm a little nervous i don't like crowds i don't like being outside like that with a large amount of people so we'll see how this goes let's head on downstairs before we miss our ride they literally are supposed to be here in like three minutes just waiting on my lift. <laughs> Looks like the dad should be here in about a minute. And the weather is not too, too bad today. It's maybe in the 20s, like in the 20s or 30s or so Fahrenheit. But yeah, it's a pretty swell. As soon as I get inside of his car, I am going to fix my shoes. As you saw, my sneakers are not even fully put on. I do that all the time. Whenever I'm running late or trying to quickly catch a ride, I'm like, ah, you're not gonna leave me here. I will come downstairs. Even if I look a little disheveled and crazy, I will fix it up as we are headed towards Manhattan. Here he is. So I made it to the park. It was super easy access. It is quite cold because it's by the water. And I see a lot of boats are passing by. The waves are crashing. We have birds here on the water. We are basically at the very tip of Manhattan. 
where we can see the Statue of Liberty, which is pretty incredible, and my favorite building, the World Trade Center, the One World Trade. And, you know, we have uh, early morning risers, we have runners and everything. So what I'm trying to do is find a spot to plop down. I kind of have, and yeah, even though I found a spot to sit down and read my book, my bill is uh, Brooklyn, it's really just here on this, uh, like, rock area so i don't know if this will work long term i was hoping to find like a bench and whatnot but we'll see we'll sit here for a little bit of time I'll let some time lapse let the air warm up a bit because i am directly cold and this is my proof every time <laughs> every time that i don't have any gloves but yeah it's really beautiful here and it's quite peaceful and i love seeing all the runners i wish i was a runner but i'm not yet maybe maybe never but yeah, i'm just gonna read my motherless brooklyn book and bask in the ambiance of it i did actually get started with it before so far it is very deviated from the actual story of motherless brooklyn i can tell you that it's very deviated from the original story which was like set in the 50s so think of the era of frank sinatra Dean Martin, those kind of folks, the Flamingos, and the, all of those doo wop type of groups. That's what the film was set in. And this one is talking about Prince, the, you know, 80s musician and um, all things 80s. So it's like, what? <laughs> I'm already getting like a little bit of a mind warp here. Like my brain's already hurting. Motherless Brooklyn. I grew up in the library of St. Vincent's home for boys in the part of downtown Brooklyn no developer yet wishes to claim for some upscale renovated neighborhood. Not quite Brooklyn Heights, nor Cobble Hill, not even Borum Hill. The home is essentially set on the off-ramp to the Brooklyn Bridge, but out of sight of Manhattan or the bridge itself on eight lanes of traffic lined with faceless, monolithic civil courts, which gray and distant though they seemed, some of us boys had seen the insides of, by Brooklyn's central sorting annex for the post office, a building that hummed and blinked all through the night. So the author is making my brain hurt with the way that he's writing Lionel's tics and his compulsions um, in the book. He basically says that, um, you know, he has Tourette's of course, which is like a nervous disorder, brain disorder. And um, you have like, you know, compulsory actions that you're doing and um, uh, a lot of repetitive type of tics and jolting movements and things like that. So it's really exhausting and nauseating to tell you the truth um, what I'm reading. So I'm kind of like slowly looking forward to this book being over. I've already um, read like a good 50% sitting here. Um, just, you know, I'm a fast reader and we're already on page like, 183 so and there's like about 288 so i don't have too too much left to go um i'm waiting for here to heat up just a bit so that way i can um start walking my way to the brooklyn bridge i have no idea how i'm going to access it to go into manhattan i'm really nervous about that but we shall see and then um i might catch a, another lift to the new york public library because it opens up at 10 a.m and um you know, I have to spend a little bit of time out here, so I might as well go to the place where all the books are. So I'm super excited about that. Um, my hands are freezing, you guys. I am not, oh no, I don't like that. You see, you see that? I don't like that. But yeah, my hands are freaking freezing because of course I don't have my gloves. Um, I think I just need to buy like 10 pairs of gloves and leave a couple in each spot. That's what my sister has always said. Like put one in the car, put one in your purse, put one in your backpack, put one in your jean pocket for crying out loud. I'm just, uh. And I started to like do some sniffles yesterday um, after coming back from uh, Long Island. Um, I just, uh, I don't know. You guys just see my hands are like this, like rigor mortis style, very cold. Like, oh my God. I only realized that I didn't give you guys like um, a little update of what I actually read. So basically we're following this guy named Lionel Esrog and he has Tourette's and from a very young age, he was taken in by his friend, um, Frank Minna to join this detective agency. Of course it's very fraudulent and it's, um, uh, they have like this whole uh, car service that they front as a 
you know, as a business, so that way they can do their detective works on, on notice and on skate. So the car service business is what is fake, and the detective agency is what is real. And they're dealing with a lot of mafia, gangsters, those type of people. And um, there's a whole um, clan of them um, from the orphanage that have been taken in by Frank Minna. We find that Frank is shot okay somewhere in new york i forget whether it's brooklyn or queens in the book um and uh some kind of deal just went south now lionel he really is extremely um uh, persistent and he will not let it go he needs to find out exactly what um, um he needs to find out exactly what happened to his um friend so he's on the case basically tracking down people all over the the different boroughs and looking for um different clues and whatnot to see who exactly is um responsible for this guy's murder and you can clearly tell that a lot of people don't necessarily want to take a look into it they are like just just leave it be like don't go meddling and poking your nose where you don't belong the one thing that I really just simply don't like I was expecting one particular story from the 50s I was expecting to hear about Moses Randolph who's like this huge power broker of the early 20th century who kind of built New York you know building bridges and and uh, different municipalities and buildings in the five boroughs um that story is not here so this whole kind of like um huge empire of a man is actually not in the story whatsoever so it is completely deviated um when you actually watch the movie which is really a, a bummer and that's gonna knock off a couple points for me i guess because i was expecting one thing and now i'm kind of like um extremely bored <laughs> So yeah, that's what's going on right now. Lionel is just doing his investigative work and it feels really good to know the different spots that he's like hitting because you actually live in, um, you know, the area that the book is um, uh, being uh, described in, the, the setting. Like for example, like this show that I um, watch, Burn Notice, okay? You may or may not know it. Um, it's set in Miami and because I live in Miami, I know a lot of different like roads and cities and streets and things like that. So it's really cool. They even ended up actually shooting my old university, Florida International University, which was super, super cool like I stood where one of the cast members stood it's so cool <laughs> but yeah like um like really you can see the like the infrastructure and the beautiful um uh, setting of uh New York because like I do live here and I've driven all up and down Manhattan and Brooklyn and Queens and Long Island and all of that um the only place I haven't gone is Staten Island I've gone to the Bronx as well so that's pretty cool like I'm been all over the place yeah so I think that this really neat. So it's the same concept as like if you were watching The Office and you live in Scranton, um, Pennsylvania, maybe you might find some uh, similar, not similarities, but maybe you might find some relatability there. So I think that that's pretty awesome when, um, you know, you can really um, imagine yourself in a setting, you know? I found some benches, but oh my God, it's worse than Long Island, you guys. Why is here even colder than the actual ocean this is like the hudson river area like this is i'm freezing right now i am absolutely terribly freezing i feel like i need an alcoholic beverage to warm me up i'm so so cold right now <laughs> next time i go out i need to be better prepared and stop doing this but yeah i was thinking of sitting here for a little bit to continue reading my book since i have a better um, view of like know the water over here compared to where i was sitting before but yeah i don't know <laughs> we'll see how it goes I was trying to go inside um, this park here because it's warmer, of course, because you're a little bit more encapsulated by the grass and the trees. And then I heard like a little rustling <laughs> of the leaves and I, I saw something and I was like, I'm looking dead at it. Like this was, yeah, right here, right here. And I was like, you know what? <laughs> it feels a little too x filesy for me. for a second <laughs> like hello like you know you want to not be too isolated because it is a little bit more removed from the path of where everybody's actually running right now because this is where we have runners and whatnot so yeah i was like um 
let's be a little bit smarter because I don't want any, you know, like a destitute person or hobo or a <laughs> junkie, I don't know. Do you live in that bush? Yes, presently that is what I do call home. But yeah, I don't want anything to happen to me, so we're going to play it smart and not dumb, you know, when people are being a little bit too brave. Yeah, so, like, it's bad enough that I am freezing. It'd be bad if I was murdered here, too. <laughs> No, I just hooked up this lady with this amazing photo shoot. I got on my knees, I, I just took so many pictures. I had her walking. She looked like a supermodel. Not that she looked like a supermodel, but I made her look like a supermodel. So this is so fun. I can't believe that I'm on top of the Brooklyn Bridge right now. It is, it's not as scary as I thought, but if you know, if you do look down past your feet and look past the planks, it can get a little dicey, but yeah, it's pretty incredible to be all the way up here with um, cars going in and out of Manhattan, in and out of Brooklyn. I find it extremely thrilling. I'm trying to see if I can make the rest of the way. I've definitely gotten in my steps, guys. Look at this view. Oh my gosh. Yeah, but it's pretty empty. I've noticed that in a lot of people's pictures, there's like usually a huge, huge crowd, but I guess because it's like freezing out, people don't wanna, I guess, you know, traverse here because it's a little bit much, you know? But yeah, the Brooklyn Bridge, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Keep on walking, keep on walking. <laughs> oh, 
lady kind of snaps the phone out of my hand, her phone. Like, let me see, this is good enough for Instagram. Let me see, let me see, let me see. I was like, ma'am, relax. There's not really anywhere I can go. I'm not gonna steal your phone and you'll also get your picture, don't worry. Could you imagine if you had to also pay to walk here, like pay a toll? <laughs> I was like, oh my God. Some people are really just oh, so dumb. Oh my gosh, she's sitting again, guys. I am. Uh, I'm so. This is oh, stupidity in action. Like, how dumb do you have to be? Oh, my sister. She was saying that I'm. Uh, look, I'm gonna walk right past. Her. Just for the shot. Same. Another one. My sister was imagining the worst case scenario. There's this movie, Fantastic Four, that came out like 20 something years ago. And she's like, oh, what if, you know, the bridge just gives out? I'm like, this isn't San Andreas. This isn't a disaster movie. Everything will be okay. We gotta take some risks sometimes, you know, not like those other people. I'm like, this is how people fall to their deaths. 911, what's your emergency? It's trying to take the perfect, the perfect picture, the perfect shot. It's just kind of sad, like. Let me take a selfie. Are you okay? Like, is it that serious? <laughs> like, I, it's stunning here, but it, it's not enough for you to just take a decent picture on the bridge. You have to go through extra lengths, like you're freaking, I don't know, evil for people or something. Like, what is this? So, I don't know, I hope you guys heard that, but I thought that was just so, like, weird. Like, you should get fined for that. Cause it's like, who's gonna have to come and save you? Perfect, thank you.
So if you didn't hear what I was saying, they were trying to take my Shakespeare book. I'm like, y'all don't even have anything that nice inside. But yeah, I started reading Shakespeare and of course, if you want that political drama, that's the one for you. I'm going to head out to the Shakespeare restaurant just for a shot because I see that the restaurant is not open until later and I'm really miffed about that. But I noticed that there's an Irish pub called Connolly's and it's supposed to be open. So oh, let's go see what we can do about that. So we got the little lions back there, but yeah, overall it's a beautiful place if you guys wanna check it out. It's free, it's gorgeous in there, it's quiet. Um, they have reasonably priced things if you wanna buy anything as well. And yeah, it's just a good old time in there. Don't start telling me that you never had chicken stew before. Of course I have. What I'm wondering where it is that you think chickens come from. The freezer section? I know, I know. I... You just surprised me. You keep doing that. Coming back from my trip from Manhattan, the New York Public Library and the Brooklyn Bridge, as well as O'Connelly's, I always, I went to the pub, the Irish pub, and I can't remember the name for the life of me. This is why I don't understand how in some procedural cop detective type dramas, when people are questioned like, what were you doing last Tuesday at 7 p.m.? Like. You expect me to remember what I was, I can't even remember where I went two hours ago. Um, I'm so bad. I think it's Con, let me just get the name right or else I'm not gonna feel comfortable proceeding. Connolly's Pub, New York. Yeah, 40, uh-huh. Yeah, 121st West 45th Street, New York, New York. Connolly's, C-O-N-N-O-L-L-Y, apostrophe S, God's comma. Comma to the top. Comma to the top? That's God's comma. Anyway, yeah, that Irish pub was so fun. It was very beautiful. I love the atmosphere, dimly lit. They had like their little green lights and it felt quite authentic and just chill. And I was welcomed into the pub by one of Ireland's greats. <laughs> I was welcomed in there by a, by a Dolores Oridian, or, oh man, I just botched her name. But yes, Dolores from the Cranberries. I forget which Cranberry song was playing, but um, it probably was Ode to My Family, Linger, like something very pensive and soft. So that was really cool. The food there was delicious, everything, 10 out of 10 stars. You guys, the ride back home though with my Lyft driver, he was a real weirdo, okay? He was like, I need a girlfriend, like, oh God imagine I'm alone in this car and it's like you're driving me home you know my location it's just so unprofessional and inappropriate I would just like barf bag like somebody who could literally be like my father <sighs> just so <laughs> I want to tell you guys that I finished Motherless Brooklyn. I was looking all over the place for the book in the apartment. I was like, where did I put it? And I ended up putting it in my little New York public library bag, so silly. Always, always, always doing that. I finished the book. 
and I couldn't be happier that I'm finished. This detective novel really had me all types of spun out and agitated and disturbed and just nauseated and I literally felt like I had glass in my brain. I get threads in my head. I get threads in my head. Yeah, like because the story was so darn deviated from the actual, I think 2019 film, I really just wanted it to be over so much faster. I lost interest in it and I found it a little bit boring for me. There is a particular character in here that I just did not care for. It was like a love interest who was just so not right for the main character, Lionel. The best thing about this story is that Jonathan Latham, he definitely knew how to write Lionel's tics and compulsions really well on the page. So I really liked that. It like really made me feel like I was inside of somebody's brain who had Tourette's. Bailey's what my head calls me. It calls me out whenever I try to resist it. There's things that calm it down. Um. So that was the best part about this whole story to me. It definitely deserves a reread, but it feels like right now, since I finished this so recently, I feel like just throwing it in the unhaul pile, but I think my sister might read this. So I'm going to hold on to it for now. And maybe I might reread it in the future, but I really was just like, oh, pressing for it to be over because this is not the story that I signed up for. If you're looking for something that's more conclusive and more comprehensive to the actual movie, then you should look up the story of Moses Randolph, who's like this huge power broker of New York. I forget. Let me see. There's like a book, I think, that was actually written. So it's a combination of Motherless Brooklyn and another book that is called The Power Broker, I think, that would make a, like a full and whole story. Yeah, his, his story was not in there whatsoever. Okay. So Robert, I said Moses Randolph. I don't know where I got that name from. Robert Moses was an American urban planner and public official who worked in the New York metropolitan area during the early to mid 20th century. Hold on, let's look up Motherless Brooklyn because I'm trying to find the other, there it is. Okay, so the other book that I'm probably going to enjoy far more because I love this kind of like power and manipulative and you know, foot to the ground type of story. It's called The Power Broker, Robert Moses and the Fall of New York. And this one is a 1974 book by Robert Caro. So that is probably going to be more up my alley. I'm just so disappointed in this book. But overall, you know, the mystery gets solved. We're not left with any loose ends or anything like that. So it was just wrapped up very well. And I think this guy's writing is incredibly, incredibly good. It is a real page turner, but uh, we weren't vibing. We weren't completely clicking. Ugh unfortunately. You guys let me know what movies you're going to be watching around St. Patrick's. Like what are your activities looking like and things like that because as you saw I popped on Leap Year which is definitely one of my favorite little silly romantic comedies. It is so corny and, and just ridiculous of course. This woman who's like this New York, hey New York again, this New York real estate type of stager. She's really sick and tired of not being proposed to by her cardiologist boyfriend, I think. And she's like, oh, let me devise this plan to go all the way to Ireland on leap day. Leap year, the day, you know, leap day is it? <laughs> like, I don't know the story, but you know what I'm talking about. For leap day, is it called leap day? I know it's leap year is the name of the story, but is it leap day? Jesus. Yeah. Leap day. Why does leap day sound so weird to say? But yeah, she's basically going to Ireland on leap day to propose to her boyfriend because it is a tradition that the Irish do over there that the girls can propose to their man and usually it says here that one tradition supposedly holds that men will not refuse a woman's proposal for marriage but of course naturally she runs into this guy Matthew Good and he's like this Irish innkeeper he owns a pub and he's a chef as well and they of course do not like each other you're lonely bitter Cynic. Better that than an Egypt. Leap year, deadly eye. Will you marry me, deadly eye? I've got a suitcase called Louis, deadly eye. He eventually has to take her all the way to Dublin, Ireland's fair city, to get her to her guy so that way she can quickly get this proposal out, which is just so ridiculous. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> But yeah, it's a kooky little quirky film and I highly recommend it if you're looking for something to watch that is around uh, this season. Okay, now I wanna quickly show you guys what I got at the New York Public Library. One of them is definitely a gift from my sister. Hopefully she doesn't see this footage by the time I get 
home because her birthday is like literally in three days. I'm going to be leaving the day after tomorrow. I got her a little present here and then I got myself something. I don't know, I don't know. Okay, so I got this super cute little journal here that just says New York and it has all of the iconic landmarks and statues and buildings and things like that and a map. So this is what it looks like. I think it's super pretty. Yeah, and I just love the like, the comic booky graphic novel look to it. So I got this one and then I have this one here that's like Times Square and it has like this night kind of scene here of New York. Hope you guys can see that. Probably not, <laughs> I'm sorry. Dublin's fair city. Okay, there you go. And I also got some stickers as well, some vintage stickers. And I just thought they would be super, super cute to have in my collection, whether I just put them on luggage, my laptop, maybe scrapbooking. But yeah, I got some very funky New York vintage stickers. Now, the thing that I actually got for my sister is... <laughs> I ended up getting her The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald, of course, but I got her the graphic novel. I've never seen a thing like this before and I thought this would be super, super cool to have in her collection because I know how much she enjoys F. Scott Fitzgerald's work. So, ooh, I've got into a very messy, bloody scene, Jesus. Um, yeah. <laughs> So that's what that's looking like. It's super pretty. I'm trying to see if I can find a pretty scene. God, the story is so sad. Anyway, yeah, I thought that that would be really cool to have as a another birthday present. So I got her that, the graphic novel of The Great Gatsby. So. I have to make sure to not forget this or else <laughs> I will be very, very upset at myself. Now, the very last thing that I'm gonna talk to you guys about today is the very intense and fun, I love politics, you guys. So the very serious political drama that is Julius Caesar, William Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. Oh, I love stuff like this, you guys. I would love to be more inclined to read theology, like theological things and, you know, things like religion and philosophical things, but that's just not really where I am being gravitated towards. I love anything politics. I just gobble it up. It runs in my veins. And of course, it makes a perfect, like, little Bermuda's <laughs> triangle if you add those three things. Like, like religion, theology, okay, is one. And then you have the corner of um, politics and then the other corner is philosophy. They all kind of basically like work in tandem. So I just absolutely love that. Like one day, maybe when I get a little older, I'll be more gravitated towards those kind of things. But for now, politics is in my veins. So what is going on in Julius Caesar, you guys? Oh my goodness. So just to kind of give you a super quick little summary of what I've read thus far at the public library, it was just such a beautiful, quiet and stunning place to read. I highly recommend if you guys ever do get a chance to go to Manhattan and are in the area, just pop in. It's completely free to go in. They do check for items in your bag, y'all. So I <laughs> just want to let you guys know, you guys, I had this like huge power bank. Like I'm talking about like, like a, a, like a block. Like it looks like, imagine a DSLR three times that size and it's a little heavy too. So I just, I rather have my power bank that I know is reliable and works. I rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. So I was like, oh my God, I'm going into this place in New York, which is a very hot spot for weird activity. You guys know with this weird looking power bank way me through and then also another thing when i was leaving after my little reading session of julius caesar one of the guards was like oh you know they ask everybody to open their bags she was like oh is this is this your book and i was like yes this is my book it was my beautiful copy of shakespeare you guys have seen it so many times it's like that big beautiful bulky gold leaf one because it looks like it's something that i could have nabbed off of their shelves because they have all of these kind of like old like lawyerly lawyer type books on their um you know stock in their shelves. I was like, oh my God, please don't think that I took it. it there's no sign on it. Like there's no like markings on my book that shows that it comes from the New York Public Library. I had it when I came in here. Don't do this. So I was like, uh, yeah, that's my book. She's like, okay, you can go. 
you can go. <laughs> I was like, good. I don't know if you guys had heard me earlier, but so yes, Julius Caesar, we are following these statesmen, these senators, these politicians who are going to conspire against the current dictator, basically Julius Caesar. So we have characters like Brutus and Cassius. Cassius is hated by Caesar and he is one of the main people who is plotting to just kind of overthrow and have a coup of the government. Yeah, so Cassius needs somebody to basically validate his reason for getting rid of Caesar and that person is going to be Brutus and Brutus is actually really liked by Caesar which is why it was such an iconic and impactful line later when they all stabbed Caesar to death et tu Brutus and you too my brother <gasps> and you too Brutus like how could you so yeah Caesar likes Brutus and this is you know the thing speaking of oh my gosh it was so funny I used to work at this place with my sister years ago and I think we were I don't know we were just talking out loud and whatnot and then there was this guy who was sitting not too too far from our um from earshot and we were talking about the Ides of March and it to Brute and the lines and the thing, okay? All the Julius Caesar feels, we were just discussing it. And then the guy was like, I'm impressed. First of all, it's like, where, how did you get here? Like, what are you doing in Florida with that accent? I'm kidding, of course, but you know, he's no, like, what are you doing? You're a Brit. Well, it sounds like you're a Brit anyway, I'm assuming. But I was like, it always stuck with me because it, it seems like, hey, somebody like me shouldn't really know such a line or understand Shakespeare or the story of Julius Caesar. So the guy was like, I'm impressed. I was like, thank you. He shouldn't be, but thank you, <laughs> I guess. And that always kind of makes me feel like I need to just stay as educated and as in the know as possible with literature. It's always good to feel like, hey, I kind of get that reference, you know? So yeah, so there's basically this huge plot, this huge conspiracy to remove Caesar by any means. And that means they are going to assassinate his butt, okay? We're gonna kill ya. <laughs> Opa! He is getting warnings from everybody, his wife, a soothsayer, um, who's basically like a fortune teller and teller telling him like, yo, beware the Ides of March, which is March 15th, which is why this vlog is going up around this time. And Caesar just does not heed these warnings. I guess it must be his, his selfish, narcissistic arrogance, I guess. It's like, bro, is it fate? Is it your destiny to die? Or is it that you are supposed to basically listen to your surroundings and you can be in charge of your own life? Like, had you heeded your wife's warning, your fortune teller's warning? Like people are basically just telling you, dude, something, something's gonna happen to you, okay? I think somebody even tried to hand him off a note. All the triads are muscling up for something real big. Now that's all you're getting out of me. Telling him, hey, look, this is, uh, this is the plot to kill you. I'm just here to tell you this before you go to the Senate chambers, okay? Um, just trying to save your life kind of here. So he doesn't heed these warnings and naturally he gets stabbed 800,000 times, which was so traumatic. I watched the old film with Marlon Brando and oh my God, that scene always gets me. It was like, it was just so shocking to see such a thing like him getting stabbed and stuff. I'm like, oh my God, crazy. So yeah, basically a civil war breaks out and I didn't even mention Mark Antony, I'm sorry but he is a supporter of um, Caesar. Cassius is not, and Brutus is basically not as well. So yeah, Brutus and Cassius, they are the ones who overthrow Caesar and Mark Anthony later on gets them in a sense. So that's kind of where I'm at in the story. I'm like a couple of ch pages, I wanna say chapters, but it's really a play, it's an act. So I'm just a few scenes away from the very finale. So I'm super excited to see exactly how that's going to end. And then I also wanna take a look at the Charlton Heston. I think there's a version of Julius Caesar with him as well. So I just wanna gobble it all up. I am such a huge Shakespeare stan. Every time that I literally read him, I feel so transported and empowered that I can understand what is being stated compared to, you know, you reading it as a kid, you're like so bored, you're so clueless, you're just, you just need as 
much help as possible <laughs> from your teachers and your, your notes and from your peers as well and from any place that you can get help from you try to understand that old English. I just absolutely love it. It's a huge decoding, deciphering, decrypting of Shakespeare's words and I absolutely love it. So well, I want to thank you guys so much for watching today. I hope that you had a lot of fun watching me go throughout the city from the Brooklyn Bridge to the New York Public Library to Connolly's Pub, reading Shakespeare and Motherless Brooklyn. In the back burner, of course we can't ever get to every single book. We have Gone Girl and The Girl on the Train and that will be discussed in my wrap up. I'm gonna point up here so that way I can come back and link it for you guys when it is uploaded. I will have that linked as well. So yeah, thank you so much for watching and I hope that you guys enjoyed the video and have an awesome rest of your day. Bye. If you're hailed from the shores of the Emerald Isle, or wish you did, if the blood in your veins is as green as a shamrock and your heart's full of blarney, then the saint of the step loves you. If you believe in the little people and you know that there's a pot of gold at the end of every rainbow, then you belong to the saint of the step.